Hello, my name is Michael Rainville. I'm a proud board member of MCN, and tonight I'm going to host Mirror on the Metro. And our guest today, tonight, is Vic Tedesco. Welcome, Hi. Vic. Welcome. I'm glad to be here. And you're also a board member of MCN. Yes. How long have you been involved with MCN? I'd say about 15 years. Yeah. And what's the biggest change you've seen in 15 years? Well, this building and the studios are very nice. Now that we have a world headquarters. Yeah, and uh, the board is pretty active. And uh, all in all, I think the channel's going in the right direction. Great, great. Well, tonight we're going to talk about your book, I Always Sing for My Father. It's a very interesting book, and I'm going to ask you some questions, if you could uh, work with me on this. I'll be glad to. So your book starts with your grandfather, Vittorio Zamboni? Yes. And when did he first come to America? I think about 1910, something like that. But he didn't stay, you know. He was called home because of some uh, major catastrophe involving a sewing machine, of all things. But things were different in those days. So, because your grandfather was a, a policeman in Italy? Yes, he was. So they called him back from America to settle this dispute? <laughs> yes. <laughs> over a sewing machine? Yeah. And uh, he got sick on the way, got pneumonia and uh, died, and they threw him overboard. So uh, that was a proper funeral back then? To yeah. They didn't have refrigeration, so... They had to get rid of him quick, and that's what they did. And then, then your father, you, you talk a lot about your father, very fond yeah. memories of your father. So he actually was not born in St. Paul, though? No, my father was born in a little city in, in Italy, southern Italy. He was born in Cotrone, Catanzari. Cotrone, Catanzari is a city, Cotrone is like the county. And, and he came to New York and then eventually St. Paul? Yeah. I think he spent a couple years in Saint, in uh, New York City and then he came to uh, St. Paul with some of his buddies and he was here in 1921. He sent for my mother. He came here without my mother. He oh. couldn't afford to bring her here. Times are different nowadays. Not only do they bring you here, but they give you money and everything else. Well, he had a, there was a seven year period where they were apart. So your, your family, you were then part of the original Irish, or excuse me, Italian immigration to St. Paul. Yes. And then you lived in Sweet Hollow. We hear so much about Sweet Hollow. Yes. Sweet Hollow was a, uh, oh, I imagine there was about 500, maybe even 750 people living down there. And at that time of Italian descent, before that it was of Swedish descent. So the Swedes were the first uh, yeah. to settle and then the Italians came. Would was, was that be considered Little Italy then? Well, Little Italy was right above Sweet Hollow. That's the area, 7th and Payne Avenue up to about 7th and Rainy, uh, Payne Avenue and Rainy, over there about Bird Street. And now, it's now called Railroad Island. And there's still some more, uh, some long-term uh, traditional Italian names, the the uh, Uruso family and the Morellis are there? Yes, yeah. And, and they, so they that's who you grew up with in that I era? I grew up with... Matt Morelli and the Russo boys. And uh, we were about 85% Italian then. It was quite a neighborhood, good place to grow up, I think, and had some real good friends, buddies, for a long, long time. And, and you talk a little bit about your, uh, you say your brother was a very handy, very skilled carpenter. Oh, my brother Nick, yeah, he could do anything. Yep, he'd never want to hire him on the hour basis, though, because he'd be there forever. 
in your book too, you talk about uh, playing on the streetcars and, and how how vibrant and alive St. Paul was back mm -hmm. when you were young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to ride the streetcars, get on the back, and then when you wanted to get off, you pull the old trolley line and the conductor would come after you. <laughs> Never catch it at all. And you, as everyone in your generation did, you started working at nine years old. What was your first job? Oh, I was selling newspapers on street corners in downtown St. Paul. And I think I actually was about eight, eight years old, you know. That young? Yep. Sold newspapers so I was about 12, 13. Started shining shoes at about 13 to 15. Played nightclubs when I was only 15 till I was 19. I went in the army and I played in nightclubs forever and I could never understand why I was never discovered and kicked out for my age, being underage. But I played, you know. So music was, uh, we don't have, the, today when we think of entertainment, we think of DVDs and televisions and sure. cable stations. But music was the really big, going dancing and, and being in bands. Oh yes, yeah. Almost every tavern had a three-piece band or four pieces. Yeah, I played at a place called Bill Gentile's Bar, 7th of Payne Avenue. It's now known as Music uh, Minnesota Cafe. It's a pretty fancy club now, I understand. But I played there when I was 15 years old. And almost every nightclub on Rice Street I played there. In fact, during my lifetime, I think I, I played in every musical spot there was in St. Paul, mm -hmm. and quite a few in Minneapolis, too. And, and uh, in addition to being a musician, you worked a little bit in the meatpacking plant. That's probably everybody in St. Oh, Paul did, huh? That was a tough job. You didn't like that very much. Well, the first day I was there, I was shoveling hamburger. Can you believe shoveling hamburger, throwing it into a vat? And the foreman come up to me and he said, you know, this job's pretty hard for you, kid. It was very nice to me. And then I ended up putting Prem cans, that's like Spam, okay. in the vats. And they'd boil them and out they'd send them out. I don't know, I imagine today everything's automated. You don't need me or somebody like me putting the Spam or the Prem cans in the in a vat. Yeah. And you're, you're part of the greatest generation. You served in the Army during World War II. What was your Army experience like? Oh, I served in the Army 42 months. And uh, I went through, well, first of all, I was in the Fort Benning, Georgia dance band. But I knew my days were limited because every day us rookies were getting replaced by somebody off of Benny Goodman's band or Tommy Dorsey's band, Harry James, all the big name musicians. So uh, and, as the army ramped up, yeah. they would they would draft these yeah, famous and musicians. And I was replaced and... by a guy, Claude Thornhill. I don't know if you ever heard of Claude Thornhill's band. Never heard of him, no. No, you never heard of him, but he was first rate band, one of the big bands. I got replaced by him after about three months in the band. Ended up in the 3rd Armored Regiment. Went on maneuvers with them. Um, came out of maneuvers. I went into a, uh, a building with uh, tear gas. I had a mask on. I came out, I guess my face was puffed up three, four times, larger than it should be. And uh, right on my um, service record, it says a soldier cannot wear a, a gas mask. So I was uh, uh, sent to Kentucky, Fort Knox, Kentucky, 
and I was put in the um, 69th Infantry Division. Okay, so you started out in the Tank Corps and later yeah, Infantry? Yeah, I was in a, started out, I was in two very famous groups. I was with the 10th Armored Division. They streamlined the, the division and more or less got rid of our regiment, our company, 777 Tank Battalion. And they sent us to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and then when they were sent overseas, I was transferred to the 69th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. And when they went overseas, I was sent to the Fort Knox Armored School, and I was there for 22 months. And when you're in Fort Knox, then you're still able to furlough back to St. Paul for weekends. Oh, you could. And I did that a few times. In fact, I got in trouble. I, I used to uh, get a three-day pass for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then I'd phony up a weekend pass from Friday through uh, Sunday. So instead of three days, I had four and a half. Uh. But uh, I was caught at home and I didn't want to show the MPs my uh, phony pass, so I was home without a pass and put in a brig in St. Paul and then sent back to Fort Knox. That wasn't a good weekend. No, it wasn't a good weekend. <laughs> I had a very interesting uh, 42 months in the service. I enjoyed it very, very much. I. Uh, when I was an instructor at Fort Knox, I had a f fellow named Franco, his last name, from Red, uh, from S New Jersey. Red, the town was Red something or another. I forgot it. And he said, uh, where do you go on weekends, Sergeant? And I was a sergeant at the time. Um, I said, Louisville. So what are you doing down there? He says, there's, there's 20 soldiers for every girl. So why don't you go up to Frankfurt? There's four girls for every soldier. Uh. I took him up on it, and he was true. Geez, the first two, three months there, I was paradise. Finally got tired of it, so many women. So I s met a little young lady down there, and I went with her for about 20 months. And we finally broke up. Her parents didn't like me. Mm. They just didn't like me. They were uh, Southern Baptists. And you were an Italian Catholic. Yeah, an Italian Catholic. They From didn't St. Like, Paul. Yeah, they didn't <laughs> like me because I was Italian. They didn't like me because I was a Catholic. They didn't like me because I was a Yankee. They had enough reasons. Sure. So we broke up. We went back about a month after and tried to heal everything, but it just wasn't the same. And I saw her a few times. She's passed away, very nice young lady. So then so. You, you got out of the Army. You're in St. Paul. The war is over. It's a very exciting time. Yeah. You started working the bands again, but you got into the radio business. Was that with one of your, with your brother again? Yeah, it was both brothers. Yeah, we, uh, my brother Albert was a radio announcer, and he worked at KDHL Fairboat, and uh, I I liked the radio business. I went to Brown School, and uh, they said you don't have a very good voice, and I didn't. I guess so. I couldn't go to the school, but I wrote to a guy in uh, Davenport, Iowa. And I told him, dear Mr. So-and-so, I'm a group of investors interested in starting a radio station in Stillwater, Minnesota. And a couple of days later, I got a phone call from him, and he said, send me down 100 bucks, and I'll come up and see you guys. At that time, 100 bucks was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So he came up to see us, and 
He said, you pay me $750 and I'll make an application to put the radio station at Stillwater. He said, when the government accepts it for filing, I'll want another $750. When, the, when uh, you get your license, I want another $750. When you start to dig the station, put it on the air, I want another $750. And after the station's on the air, I want $750. $3,750, a lot of money at that time. Well, in the meantime, we didn't have any money, but uh, people were knocking on our doors to invest with us. So finally, Bill Johns, the Johns Ritter family that had ties to the St. Paul Dispatch Pioneer Press, he uh, put up 77.5% of the money, and he owned 22.5% of the stock. And, my brothers and I, we own the rest of the station. And you grew that to 14 stations eventually? Well, eventually, between the three brothers, there were 14 radio stations. And we had a television license, too, for Channel 17. Oh. Ah. <laughs> long time ago. A long time ago, uh. before the universe, uh, before Channel 2 picked it, picked it up. But we couldn't raise the money to put the to put it on the sure. air. And, we, and Vic, you're, you're probably best known though for your political career. So in the mid '60s, uh, you started uh, uh, a campaign. You, you, your approach in your book, you said, was a Richard Ritchie and a Fiore Palmero. Palerine. Palerine, and they you didn't think you could be a politician. No, no. But the three of us went to a place called the Lambs Club on East 7th Street, and I had a few martinis, and after that I guess I was ready to run for Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Much but less I, city I council. <laughs> I, I did run for city council, and uh, I ran third out of 27 people in the primary, and fourth out of 12 in the uh, final, and I was elected one of the six people to be elected to the council. And back then, it was it was uh, at-large elections in St. Yeah. Paul? It wasn't by, what are they called now, wards? Wards, yeah. Wards. So there were, there were six that ran the whole city. Yeah. Chosen. And I think the ward system was the lousiest of the three, and I still think so. Mm -hmm. Because all you had to really worry about was your own ward. And if you got elected in there, what do you care about? About the rest of the, the city. The rest of the city. Sure. And, and back then, too, each uh, council member or alderman uh, ran, uh, a, a, ran a commission or ran a certain part of the city. You ran the Parks and Rec Commission. Well, yeah. I ran, after we became ward system, I ran as the east side representative on the city council, but the southern half of the east side. We ended up with seven uh, council people, and two of them were from the east side, and I was the southern part. And I got elected 11 times, about five times without any opposition, and I did fairly well with the people, but I worked hard with the people. Sure. And Vic, you worked very hard in your park and rec job. In your book, you have some great stories. Can you tell us a little about Casey the gorilla? Yeah. Yep, I'll tell you, being the parks commissioner in St. Paul, at first I was so angry at the mayor, my dear, dear friend, Tom Byrne, for point me because it was a troubled spot. But I guess I was just the man for the job. It went real well. I enjoyed it the best six years of my life was being the parks commissioner in St. Paul. I uh, went out to Como one day and they're weighing Julie the snake. And what they said is, uh, Commissioner, let's get you on a scale. We'll take your weight and 
determine how much she weighs and all that. Well, she was 19 foot long. And, and this was a python? Python snake. And they wrapped her around me. And all of a sudden, she started to squeeze. And I'll tell you, if it hadn't have been that we had enough people out there, I'd be pretty close to Como, which was Calvary around the corner <laughs> of the Calvary Cemetery. Um, they finally got her off of me. And I had to go to Washington, D.C. that afternoon. And I got off the plane at night, and there's my picture on the front page of the Washington Star, no longer published. I don't know if that had anything to do with their... To, to Why they went down. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and then another case was KC the gorilla. KC, I had to take him to... Uh, to Omaha on a lend-lease deal. We lend them to the zoo in Omaha so they could have a little baby gorilla down so there. So you took him there for a little romance. A little romance, and yeah. And I guess he did quite well. It was the very interesting. <laughs> did, you, did you give him some pointers on the way down? <laughs> no, no I, <laughs> I guess they didn't get transferred from humans. Uh, really was an interesting part of my life. You know, I, another part of your book that just fascinates me, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy St. Paul so much. I was so fortunate to go to the College of St. Thomas, and when I'm over visiting my friends, I think of how beautiful it is at Rice Park and the Landmark mm -hmm. Center. And most people don't realize that they wanted to tear the Landmark Center down when you were in office, yep. and you fought yep. against that. Well, life is strange. Frank Marcitelli, who had a high position in Mayor Cohn's um, administration. And Mayor Cohn, my estimation, was an excellent, underrated <coughs> mayor. They wanted to tear the, the landmark, landmark center, center down. down. He said, Commissioner, you know what it costs to heat that GD place and all that, and just standing there, and what do you make it into, Frank, if you're going to tear it down. We'll put some grass over it, make a nice green space. Well, I said, you know, I was in Italy, and they're saving old buildings, and here we're tearing them down. And uh, I, I finally got the rest of the council to go along with me. And, and you saved it. Saved it. Yes, I will. I'll take credit for saving the old post office. I can't take any credit for the Landmark Center because that was done by a bunch of local okay. people. There were some very influential people there. And you kept that core group of those beautiful buildings in downtown St. Paul. Yeah. You, you also talk yeah. about uh, Mayor McCarthy. You, you mentioned Mayor Byrne and Mayor Cohen, but Mayor McCarthy, he was very flamboyant. Very you, you and him rubbed wrong a yeah. few times. Yeah, we started out as very dear friends, but Mayor McCarty made a major mistake. He forgot the girl that brung him to the dance. And I guess- What do you mean by that? By that I meant he started dishing on people that had helped him okay. to get elected. His supporters. His supporters. Okay. And eventually he didn't have too many friends. McCarthy was brilliant. I don't know what kind of education he had, but one thing he had was street smarts for sure. Mm -hmm. It would have been a great, great mayor. Instead, I don't know, he got wrapped up in a lot of the BS and the hamburger sure. nightclub, uh, the White Castle stuff, and, and he just, started doing everything kind of self-punishment, uh, you know. He, he made some bad mistakes. Made uh, you, you also talk about how much you enjoy working with Governor Rudy Perpich, that he oh, was a good governor. Rudy Perpich was a great, great man, if I may say so. I really enjoyed working. I worked for him a little bit, too, after I left the service, uh, after I left the the consul, I was a, 
Amsbud, senior Amsbudman for the uh, state of Minnesota. I go to different senior organizations yeah. in different cities. But I only did that for about two, three months. I could see there wasn't much work there, and I wasn't just going to hang around and pay a check, uh, get a paycheck right. and not, not earning it. You have some very fond words, too, for uh, Walter Mondale. Oh. That he, he was quite the, the, the Mondale, good politician. to this day, I think is probably the, the nicest, most honest politician I ever met. Mm -hmm. Mondale, Perpich, Larry Cohen, Tom Byrne, a lot of good guys in town. Sure. And Victor, we're, believe it or not, it's been a whole half hour already. Yeah. Uh, where can someone buy your book? Could you tell us where to buy your book? Well, you can get my book at uh, Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon. You can get my book almost anywhere. Okay. Well, you, you've done a great job, and we really appreciate you coming down here, uh, mm -hmm. uh, taking time off your busy schedule to come to Channel 6. and. And uh, thank you so much. You have one final bit of wisdom uh, for the ages here. At 88, you must have really seen a lot in your life. Oh, I've had a good life. I had a beautiful, wonderful wife. I lost her three years ago. And I lost a daughter that was a beautiful girl. Um, Ten years ago, I have my life worthwhile at this point. I have to give most credit to my daughter, Patricia Ann Blair, and my son, Anthony Tedesco, who happens to be a uh, prosecuting attorney for the city of St. Paul. That's great. So you but, still got that law enforcement in his blood. Well, it's like your grandfather. Yeah, I don't have much. Yeah. Tony's a very independent young man, and, and he knows what he's doing. Well, thank you so much, Vic, for coming down today, and uh, we really appreciate you being on Mirror on the Metro. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. God bless you.